And I got a very interesting Patreon question, namely how infantry doctrine for the 21st century could look like for our children. So basically 10 to 20 years, depending how old your children are or if they're not born yet. So I take 10 to 20 years because, yeah, to keep it a bit more focused. And also since it's a very big question, I would say I focus mainly on the West, where I basically mean Europe, the United States and the various allies, which you can consider the West. Depends who you put in there or not. And also we only focus on the army. I mean, it's infantry doctrine, but yeah, we keep out now US Marines and Naval Infantry and, and that around. So, and we align this basically now on three major points. We need to look at current threats, current trends, and then what are current missions or missions around these. Because else I can just talk on, but it doesn't make very much sense. So these are just a few threats, trends, and missions. There are probably way more, but these are along the, those lines. You have probably different assumptions, then you can also use those and align them and see to what conclusions you come. So basically one of of the current threat which I personally see is basically the return of tribalism. So you have a very polarization of the left and the right on the political scale, also in religious aspects and cultural aspects. This is due to several reasons, one of which I think is that basically the national monopoly for, for the narrative was lost due to the internet. So you have many more information coming from everywhere. Before that, the nation state usually had basically an information monopoly. So it could control to a very large degree what everybody was more or less thinking. Because there was the information sources were limited. And propaganda could be limited. There were gatekeepers for information. You had to have a major newspaper to get information out there, or a major TV station or a radio station. And they were basically all to a certain degree under the control of the state, depending of course on the state, on the, on the culture and everything. But with the internet, basically everyone can produce now a video that one million people see, like I did with my infantry tactics video. And I only had a computer, basically, and some recording equipment. This was not a major investment, not at all. So this is where I think tribalism to a certain degree comes in, but there are many other factors like the economic situation, which has a major impact. So then there's of course terrorism, which you can fight domestically or on foreign ground in various ways counter-terrorism is performed, but terrorism is a major issue in the West right now. It's in the minds of most people due to ha happening in various states. And then there of course are civil wars, like in Syria, and here we have, especially in Syria, multiple factions with multiple interests that it gets really complicated. You have so many actors there, so the question is how to intervene in such a conflict if you intervene and what? So this is very important and later on if you look at the geostrategic situation and the various missions and goals you have. But here this is a very different kind. And then there's of course the potential of conventional wars again. because. Of course, since the Second World War, many people think, oh, there will never be a war or something else. Yeah, we had this so many times in history and I think it's utter bullshit and just utter negligence. And as we see in the West, like in Germany or also Canada, we have major problems with getting proper equipment and everything because it seems our leadership thinks we don't need any more weapons. Quite interestingly, we sell them all over the world and make large profits with it, but yeah. Anyway, there will probably be conventional wars again in, in a certain way. Probably not the mass wars we saw in the First and the Second World War, but you can't count it out. And this is also very important. If you think conventional wars will happen again, this will have a major influence on your infantry doctrine. Do you have a mass, mass army or do you go for certain elite troops? So you, you have to keep that in mind. So whatever threats you determine the most important for your country, this, on these lines you should deploy infantry doctrine if you think you can solve it with infantry, of course. Then let's look at the trends. Basically, conscription may, may be coming back in Europe. Sweden discussed it, I think, in 2016 and Germany also in 2017 along those lines. There are links in the description on this. 
In Austria, it's also very interesting that the conscription numbers, the, the people going to national service were decreasing all the time. But in 2015, it went up again. So you can already see there are certain different developments happening. 2015 was for Europe and I think also for the rest of the world a major change for the West in the thinking. Since then, a lot of, of happened. You see it in the elections, you see it everywhere. And this comes also with another point, with the militarization of police. And also with the combination of police and military in Western countries again. If you look at France, Operation Sentinel, which started in January 2015, has at least 10,000 soldiers deployed along with, I think, 5,000 policemen. So we have armed forces, we have military in Europe again during peacetime patrolling the streets. This is something most people seem to ignore or want to ignore, but it is happening and you can't deny it. Operation Sentinel started in January 2015 and it's still going on, from what I read up. So keep that in mind. This is also an important aspect. Then we have unmanned vehicles on the technological side. We have drones. We have, we have there was a thing now, this, this robot that could open a door, I think from Boston Dynamics or something. This also, and, and the technology becomes more accessible for everyone. So how can you use that to enhance your infantry or replace infantry in certain aspects? And what we also see in the, in the various, in terrorism and also in the civil wars, the weaponization of consumer tech. For instance, I think using regular, basically toy drones to drop weapons or mortar on just because you have cameras on it and real time view and everything that you can use them basically as small bombers. This is also an interesting aspect because this will also increase because there are more drones coming, they are, they are faster, they can take more payloads, they are cheaper to build or cheaper to buy. I mean, they cost basically nothing if you compare them with, with, with high-tech weapons and they still can do a lot of damage in certain aspects, especially if they are deployed against non-major combatants. I mean, against the high-tech army, they usually their power is limited, but also if you're in conventional war again, you have high-tech high drones on both sides. So I have to interrupt myself here because in the original recording I made some errors. But I let a few uh, colleague, for a computer scientist who is better in AI, let her review my, my rambling and there were quite some errors. So here's the important thing about technology and AI, which also need to be accounted for. Basically, what assumptions are taken about artificial intelligence and the, the whole technology in general, how to prevent uh, from being hacked. So how much, how much technology do you put in your whole, in your weapon system and especially in your whole communication and command infrastructure and all the other places. Also, to what degree, what do you allow in, in, in terms of, of consumer tech? Because... For instance, cell phones of soldiers or of even worse officers, journalists could be hacked and they could eavesdrop with, with these devices. Also, they all now have a GPS device. You have a GPS device basically in most, most cameras right now. So you, you have them everywhere. So you also need to look at this because if the enemy can hack into the system or one of the many, many subsystems, you have a real problem. So you need also address this threat. And the other is, of course, with, with artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence in the recent years evolved tremendously. This is to a certain degree to do various new development, but also because we have a lot of more processing power, which also develops quite rapidly. I mean, if you look at your smartphone right now, this thing probably has more processing power than a computer had 10 years ago, a desktop computer. So, and the same goes for the military and everywhere else. So you have a, a very different situation here in terms of what artificial intelligence can do and what will happen. It's, it's really hard to say because even the experts worry to a certain degree what could happen or what could not happen. And basically we don't know. 
what's going to happen. There could be a self-aware AI at some point. Maybe there will never be a self-aware AI. It's really hard to tell. And then when there's a self-aware AI, what will it do? Because it could be everything. It could have goals that completely align with us, with ours, or they don't align with our goals. And then we might have a problem. I mean, it depends how it reacts. So then you need to think how you put stop gaps in your various technologies and your command infrastructure that if there's a certain breach from hacking, from AI or whatever, how you, how you deal with it. Are you going for a decentralized system, for instance, or a heavily centralized system, but where you can break off or where you can contain breaches? So the next part is now we had threats, trends, and now we have missions. So what for your country or faction or whatever you want to call it are the main aspects? Is it counter-terrorism? Is it counter-insurgency in another country, for instance? Or is it intervention in civil war? And also what kind of intervention? Do you want to stop a civil war? Do you want to protect certain, certain areas in a civil war? Do you want to get out your, your hostages in a civil war? And then, of course, there's the question of conventional warfare. And on the other side is also countering protests, population control to a certain degree, crowd control, not population control, crowd control. Is this a major issue for your country? And then you need to finally determine who you are. Where are you? What is your geopolitical situation? In Austria, we have a very different situation than, for instance, Sweden or Great Britain or Spain. We are in the center of, of Europe and for conventional war, for instance, we are more or less safe. We can retreat to the Alps to a certain degree. Of course, there are certain areas, the east, that is mainly exposed, but there's Vienna and yeah, who cares about Vienna? Anyway, there's a different situation there. And then you need to declare what are your strategic goals. This is very important because without goals, everything else is yeah, infantry doctrine for what? And based on these strategic goals, you derive your missions and tasks. And based on that whole assessment, you develop your doctrine. And based on your general army doctrine, you derive your infantry doctrine. So let's, let's take a very short overview examples. For instance, you assume conventional warfare will return. You don't know who exactly will attack you right now, but let's see. You build for a mass army with a res uh, reserve system. So basically you train like we do like in Austria and Switzerland right now. You train every year, you train a certain amount of recruits for several months and then you, you let them go. And in case there is a war, you mobilize them. This makes only sense if you need a lot of rifles and in conventional warfare. If you want to fight terrorists with that, it's probably not going to happen. It's not very useful. And it also applies if, in, for instance, Switzerland and Austria, due to the Alps, can be defended in a rather, in certain areas are hard to take, even with high tech and everything, because, yeah, mountains limit to a certain degree what you can do. Then, of course, you could go another way. For instance, you, you could use, you go for a small, interventionist force, yeah, expeditionary force. Then you want small elite teams, highly trained troops, which have close support, for instance, with drones, air support drones, like, not like drone strikes, but more like a surveillance, that you always know what is going on. So for instance, that you also have basically an auto map also there and you see where the enemy is going all the time. Maybe this is already deployed, but probably usually now the commanding officer has it and now you can give it every man in the squad, for instance. If this makes sense, because to a certain degree too much information might also overwhelm certain soldiers. And, or you could use these drones or ground vehicles to provide further fire, fire support. So you could go, for instance, with special drones and vehicles for local information and fire superiority that you know what is going, that you're basically a bit more all aware, which is very important, for instance, in an urban environment or even in, in, in a forest or something. Because if you know where the enemy will be or around the corner, you have a certain aspect, you can call in your, your mortar round or you, you know, for instance, you have several surveillance drones and you know, okay, 
there's an enemy position around the corner there and then you call in the airstrike or you deploy smoke and then come the other side around. This is high tech at its best form with elite troops. For this, you don't want to use conscripts. You want to have highly trained professionals which can work with the equipment and also work to a certain degree if a certain aspect of the equipment fails. Then another aspect could be if you're going for a major expeditionary force, the strategic mobility is very important. So for instance, you go for strategic mobility, but still with a lot of firepower and everything. So you maybe go for airborne vehicles. You go for like the Germans have the Wiesel airborne tank, for instance. It's still rather fast. There's some armor on it, but you can also deploy anti-tank weapons there. But you have the strategic mobility that you maybe can deploy with the proper transport planes, for instance, a, a whole division or in, in a matter of, of days with the logistics and everything. So then you need to build up the transports, the transport planes, also secure the airspace and everything, complete different way, depending on that. Then you could also build elite units for pinpoint attacks or for counter-terrorism operations in your country. Another way would be a militia style force for crowd control and police support, basically for suppressing the population that you have a large amount of militia that patrols every city and every village you have. And so that, that they always, that there's not any uprising or anything or just con uh, to provide security. I mean, it could be both, that you provide security. To a certain degree, Operation Sentinel could be seen in this way. I didn't look further into it, but to a certain degree, it's a show of force, which to a certain degree should provide amount of security in the population. It can go both ways because I know this for instance when in Austria or in Western Europe I usually see police I usually feel okay there's something going on something bad happening but I talked with people in Argentina for instance and there's police at certain points everywhere present and I usually I felt uncomfortable and they told me now they feel comfortable because there's police there so there's a different perception from what is common for you because for me, when I run around, there's no police. I think, yeah, it's pretty safe here. When I see police everywhere, I'm usually, um, what's going on? But it's different in, from where you come from, from your culture and, and everything else. So then also you could go for no infantry at all. You just rely on drone strikes because, yeah, you have the, the position that you don't need infantry anymore. Or you think you don't need infantry anymore. For certain kinds of warfare, you don't need infantry. But... I think infantry will always be to a certain degree there if you deploy any major thing. I mean, counterinsurgency without infantry probably can't work unless yeah, you're going for the, well, eliminate everyone approach. Well, I hope you like this short excursion into some unknown territory and let me think what your ideas or your thoughts on this. Maybe you see completely different threats and trends and missions. As said before, those are just a few I took and which came first to mind. Now, if you want to know more about current military forces, maybe check out my video on Russia's military power in 2017. Or if you're more into medieval times, check out my video on medieval warfare. Anyway, sources are in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.